Just as we go live here, I just want to let everybody know, producer Dez was a little bit rattled, but guess what? House of Champions is back, baby! Welcome to House of Champions, YouTube friends, dropping your comments and questions in that chat, and make sure you smash the like and subscribe buttons as we talk. There he is with the main man himself, Fabrizio Romano. Here we go. I'm enjoying, I'm joined by the House of Champions dream team once again. Welcome back, James Bench. Golf clap, golf clap for James So Bench. good to be back. And Nigel Rio Coker. Nigel, how are you doing, buddy? It's great to see you, but let's get into it. Let's get into it. The hardest working and most knowledgeable man, apparently, on the internet right now is Fabrizio Romano. Fab, how are you doing, buddy? All great, all great. My pleasure to be here, as always. Busy with many things happening, so I'm sure will be a nice second part of January on the market. Well, thanks to everybody out there for joining us. Please make sure you drop in your comments and questions. And you can always see our Aaron's already in the comments right now. So is the Fab Chelsea King asking lots of comments. We'll get to the questions in just a minute. But for Fabrizio, let's begin with Barcelona. All kinds of rumors about Barcelona. What's happening inside the camp? What's happening outside of the camp? The product on the field right now is pretty impressive. But there are some moves taking place. Let's begin with Kessi and Brozovic. What are we hearing and what are you hearing? What can you tell us? Yes, it's a particular story because this story is through intermediaries. So there is um, agents in football who are proposing ideas, uh, agents close to Barcelona and Inter discussing these potential ideas. And so the idea is uh, on the table, has been discussed between Barcelona and Inter in the last two, three days. What happens is that it's on the managers now, especially on Xavi. Xavi has to decide what he wants to do with Frank Cassi, uh, if he wants to continue with him until the end of the season, or maybe if he wants to give Cassi the chance to go back to Italy after a difficult first part of the season at Barcelona. So Xavi is now the man who has to decide about this swap deal because from what I understand, uh, Kessi at the moment would be open to joining Inter. So on player side, there is no big problem. On Marcelo Brozovic side, his priority would be to stay, but there is still no discussion with Barca. Now depends on Barcelona, depends on Xavi. And at the moment, there is still no green light from Xavi to let Frank Kessi go. So at the moment, it's an idea, it's a discussion, but it's still not an advanced negotiation. I think it will take some time uh, to see and to decide what Barca want to do with that kind of, of negotiation. So let's see probably in the next few days and not today. Fab, I've got a couple of questions on uh, on, on Brozovic and Inter and this whole deal. Um, first of all, kind of what is Inter's view on, on this swap? Because we know Brozovic is a fantastic player. I mean, for me, he seems perfect for Barcelona, the classic Barcelona tempo-setting midfielder. Kessier? I, I mean, you know, played wonderfully for AC Milan. That's why he's at Barcelona. But, you know, it's a bit of a change. And then secondly, we've seen this before with Barcelona and... Uh, Italian clubs, a little bit of a uh, amortization, a little bit of a let's book some profit and, uh, and uh, you know, with, with Arthur and Pjanic. I mean, surely there, there yes. must be a sort of consciousness that, that that looked really bad and brought a lot of heat on Juventus. Yes. Um, for the second question, what I want to say is that this one looks completely different because I agree with you that Arthur Melo and Pjanic was... Uh, something unbelievable also for the value they gave to the players. It was around 65 million Artur Melo and 80 million euros Pjanic and that was completely out of the market. So in this case about Kessie and Brozovic, the value is different because Brozovic just extended his contract with Inter. He's one of the best midfielders in, in Serie A. Kessie has been a great midfielder in Serie A for many years with Milan and then moving to Barcelona he had some problems. So I think in this case could be something more normal. The point to answer your first question about Inter, first of all Brozovic, I agree with you. He's a fantastic player he would be perfect for Barcelona. He's a traditional regista, as we say here in Italy, because he's really the mind of the team. He's, he's the brain of the team. is something really important for Inter. But he had some injuries this year. And what happened is that Chalanoglu started to play in that position. And Inter had a fantastic season, with, especially in Champions League, against Barcelona, with uh, Chalanoglu scoring a goal against Barca, but also Barella and Mkhitaryan doing very well. So what's happening is that now Inter are thinking to bring in a physical midfielder instead of Brozovic, uh, because at the moment they can maybe need different kind of skills. This is why Kessie is in the list. And also, Inter wanted to sign Kessie when he was at Atalanta, before his move to Milan. He's always been one of the favorite players of Inter director Ausilio. They tried many times some swap deal with Milan years ago to sign the player, and that was not possible. So they always wanted Kessie. They are now looking for a physical midfielder. For example, to, to give you more details, another player they love is Yunus Musa, the United States <laughs> national team player. Really good player. They really appreciate him, but he's not on for sale in January. So they want that kind of player. Let's see if this whoop deal with Brozovic would be the right solution or not. Staying with Barca, Fab, just a quick one. We've seen some rumours about Aubameyang wanting to return. Is there any truth into that or anything that could happen potentially? 
Yes, the problem is legal there because um, officially for FIFA, Obama Young can only play for Barcelona and Chelsea this season because he already played for Barca in this season and also, of course, for Chelsea. So officially he can only play for Barcelona or Chelsea, but some La Liga sources are telling Barcelona in the last few weeks that they are not allowed to do not even the the deal between Barca and Chelsea in January now because it will be the third move for the player this year and this is why it will not be allowed so they are trying to understand with the Liga if they are allowed to negotiate or not what I'm told on Barcelona side on Obama Young is they would love to bring him back the feeling they always had with Obama Young was great the board the manager Xavi great relationship with the player there is one point they can only sign Obama Young on a free transfer and remember that Chelsea paid good money for Obama Young in the summer so for yeah. Barca only free transfer lower salary and so I think it's going to be a complicated one. Uh, you're watching House of Champions. It's Ian Joy with Nigel Real Coker, James Benj, and Fabrizio Romano. I shout out to certain people who are in the chat right now, the fab Chelsea King. Uh, Fabrizio is the best. Aaron saying thanks for the mention, Ian. We love you, Aaron. Thanks for tuning in. BX Gunner 81, good morning and good afternoon to everybody out there. We have a couple of questions about Barcelona. Let's stick on Barca right now. Uh, Jorge is asking Mukoku to Barcelona. You can ask that one in just a quick second, Fabrizio, because I've got another one for you. This one from our Ali. He says, Fabrizio, can you give me some news on the the Argentinian talents that Barca are looking at. So let's talk about the 16-year-old Prestiani. Now, Fabrizio, I love this kid. Now, one of the reasons why I love this kid, because he plays with the socks rolled down. He is an absolute talent. What's the latest on this kid? Very good player, very good player. Uh, there, he has a close around 12 million, and this is why Barcelona are monitoring the situation. Let me say, not just Barcelona, because, for example, also Real Madrid sent their scouts to follow this player, also other clubs in England. So the race is absolutely open, but we can confirm that Barca are following Prestiani. They are tracking him to see how is the situation also around the player, uh, meaning with agents and this kind of things. So Barca are informed on Prestiani, but we are not yet in the process to say, okay, he's going to Barcelona. It will take uh, some time. And for Mukoko, I don't see him moving to Barca in January. I think Mukoko could become a target if Mukoko will leave on a free in the summer. But now negotiations for ex to, to extend his contract with Borussia Dortmund are advanced. So I think there is still a very good chance, as we already said, for Dortmund to extend Mukoko's contract. Mm. Fab, two players that Arsenal would be pretty interested in now that the Madrid uh, situation has gone south for them. And what a strange experience that was on my holiday. Um, Ferran Torres and Rafinha. I mean, from what I'm hearing, and I know you've reported the same Rafinha just not really that keen on leaving yet. But Ferran Torres, is that something where, where Arsenal could exploit uh, Barcelona's need for cash? I think this could be uh, potentially an option, but what I'm told as of today is that there are no negotiations between Arsenal and Barca. So Arsenal have not called Barca to ask about Ferran Torres as of now. Let's see if that will happen. But at the moment, it's still uh, just an idea. Uh, as you mentioned, Rafinha wants to wants to stay at Barcelona. I think he's not rejecting Arsenal or this kind of thing. Simply wants to stay at Barca. He was fighting to go uh, to Barcelona in the summer. We remember how complicated was that deal with Chelsea and Arsenal involved and they only wanted Barcelona. So now the player wants to stay and to complete his season at Barca. Ferran Torres did basically the same in December one year ago uh, when he was at Man City and he started to speak to Pep Guardiola to uh, make his Barcelona deal happen and he wanted this Barca move and so I think both players want to stay at Barca let's see what Barca will decide but at the moment my understanding is that Barca are only allowing Memphis Depay to leave on the other players they want to continue with the same squad and then probably to change in the summer so not an easy one for Arsenal I think any update on Memphis Depay right now? I know you just mentioned his name right there. I'm hearing some rumors with Atleti and maybe Carrasco, someone on the move there. But any update you have on Depay? Yes, for Depay we had, first of all, rumors in the last few days about uh, an Inter swap deal and others with with Inter with uh, Joaquin Correa. But uh, his agent, uh, Sebastian Ledur, um, told me there is absolutely no chance that Depay will go to Inter. Why? Because Depay wants to go to Atletico Madrid. Depay wants to join Atletico Madrid. He feels it's the best possibility for him. There is already uh, an agreement ready between Depay and Atletico Madrid on the personal terms. So now it's on Barcelona and Atletico Madrid. The two clubs are in direct contact every single day. It's true that Barca asked for Carrasco. They have an excellent relationship with his agent. Pinin Zahavi and so Barcelona are trying to push on player side to include Carrasco in this Depay deal the point is Simeone and Atletico Madrid they want big money for Carrasco they don't consider a swap deal between Depay and Carrasco uh, on the same level so at the moment it's about the formula how Atleti will be able to reach an agreement with Barcelona for Depay the feeling around both parties is that at the end Memphis has a very good chance to go to Atletico Madrid and become Joe Felix's replacement 
You're watching House of Champions. It's Ian Joy with Nigel Rio Coker. James Bench, who is back from vacation, apparently got the best suntan in London right now. And also <laughs> the one and only Fabrizio Romano. Let's turn our attention to the tune. Newcastle United fans who do jump in the chat every now and again. They want to hear the latest news about transfers. I mean, there are many names that have been mentioned, Fabrizio, with Newcastle. And I know you're really impressed with the business, the way that they're going about signing players. Ziyech has been mentioned, Gallagher mentioned, Loftus-Cheek mentioned. What are you hearing about the tune? Well, it's true that they are keeping an eye on the Chelsea situation. All these names uh, you mentioned are players appreciated by Newcastle. Of course, they're not going for all of them, but Conor Gallagher is a player they really wanted in the summer. Uh, and so he's always been on, on Newcastle list. Uh, also, to, to mention other players like Ziyech, they are waiting to understand if Chelsea will allow the player to leave maybe on good conditions after signing Mudrik. So they are keeping an eye on the Chelsea situation to understand if there will be some, some opportunity. This is correct. But also Newcastle are looking for a new right back called Idrame from Leeds and also Ivan Fresneda from Valladolid are two names they are they are following in the midfield I will keep an eye also on other players we know Tillemans is a big opportunity let's see what the player will decide if he wants to move now or on a free in the summer and so this could be an opportunity for Newcastle but there are also other clubs in the list and then on Newcastle side I'm told their big target I think is not going to be an easy one in January but for the summer is still James Madison a player they wanted already last summer they're still tracking him they're still keeping contacts and so Madison is always kind of obsession for, uh, for Newcastle also to share some positive news Bruno Guimaraes injury is not serious so it will take some weeks, not months, and it means that they are not forced uh, into signing a new midfielder. And this is why they are now pretty relaxed. If there will be the right opportunity, they will act. Otherwise, they're happy with the team they have. All right, let's turn our attention to ownership. There are a lot of rumors happening around the Premier League with uh, billionaire owners trying to buy football clubs, minority stakes, whatever stake it is in big football clubs. We have to talk about Manchester United. Sir Jim Ratcliffe confirms that he is in for Manchester United. What are you hearing about Manchester United, the potential sale, uh, Jim Ratcliffe's bid? Uh, any information you could give us would be great. Yes, for sure there is this bid uh, now. It's, it's public on Sir James Lackfleet, uh, as, he, as he mentioned yesterday to his group uh, Ineos. So they are now in the process to bid for Manchester United. What I'm told is that it's not the only group, of course. So they've gone public, but there are also other groups interested in buying Manchester United. There are conversations ongoing. So let's see how long it will take. The feeling is that they want to get it done, of course, before the summer, to plan for the summer window. It will be a really important step for Manchester United. So also people into the coaching staff, into the board, they're waiting because they hope they can plan for the summer transfer window with new owners to have clear ideas to help Eric Ten Hag to continue on his project because this kind of owner situation is influencing Manchester United market. Of course, uh, they're not investing big money in January because of this Glazers situation. Uh, Glazers are looking, from what I'm told, around six, seven billions to sell Manchester United uh, as soon as possible. So conversations will continue, but this is going to be crucial also for the market to plan for summer transfer window, to understand how they will proceed also new contracts because, for example, May United are now negotiating with with De Gea, with Marcus Rashford, with Diogo Dalot, with Alejandro Garnacho. Many conversations ongoing, but you have new owners would really help to get things done as soon as possible. Yeah, a lot of people out there who are jumping in the comments right now, be patient with the questions you're asking. Um, I appreciate it if you're a little bit more patient. You too, Ranger. I see you there. Sale news on Manchester United, brother. I get it. Then I see you following up with sale news on Manchester United. And brother, ask news about Manchester United. Fabrizio, just give you news about Man United. So talk a little bit more kindly. This is my house, the House of Champions, and Fabrizio has only got a little bit of time with us. So be patient, everybody out there who's jumping in the comments. But keep those comments coming. And thank you so much for liking and subscribing. Let's turn our attention to Liverpool Football Club, Qatari Sports Investment. They deny that they're actually involved in trying to get a little stake at Liverpool Football Club. Now, Fabrizio, I don't know if you saw that picture with Mohamed Salah having uh, yeah, so. a little cup of tea or some dinner with the Qatari Sports Investment uh, owner. Um, but at the same time, is there any rumour to this? Could we see QSI potentially buy Liverpool Football Club? What's the latest there? No, they are denying in public and in private. So the message is very clear. Uh, they they mentioned they are not involved in this. They mentioned that Nasser al Khalifi was having this conversation uh, with uh, Mo Salah in a very friendly way. We know how is Nasser al Khalifi is is friendly. Yes, but this is Nasser, eh, honestly. I have to say that with many players, he has a great relationship. He's really respectful. So this is what they state, but it's also the feeling also with many other players, they had they had conversations. So uh, this is the situation at the moment. It's quite on Qatar's side, but let's see with other groups. We know Liverpool are for sale, so this is another really important step also because we mentioned before for Man United, but for Liverpool, it's even more important because also the director, Julian Ward, will leave the club at the end of the season. So they have to rebuild the board. And I think they really need something fresh, something new, uh, because 
because, for example, the midfield situation uh, is something that is not probably was not handled on the Liverpool level, I think, in the last few months. Uh, they had many injuries. Uh, they also signed a player like Artur Melo and then got injured after many injuries with Juventus. So they need something fresh. They need new ideas. They need a new strategy. They did excellent work for many, many years. But now this new owner situation will help to rebuild the board and also to help Jurgen Klopp on the transfers. Let's be honest, if any club, any fan base is going to take issue with Qatari investment, I mean, this isn't all Liverpool fans, but a lot of Liverpool fans, you know, such a politically active club, they would, yes. I think, feel quite uncomfortable uh, with Qatari investment. But on the other side of Stanley Park, Everton sort of in complete free fall, but it sounds like they're backing Frank Lampard, you know, in the in the dugout. But but what about in the transfer market, Fab? Yes, it's not easy for Everton eh? because financially uh, they have not the power to go there and sign important players, maybe for 40 or 50 million. So, so many players are worried about the situation uh, in the table. And so it's normal to see a difficult market, I think, for Everton. But they're trying. They're trying to run positions. For example, Kamal Din Sulemana from Rennes, this uh, Ghanaian winger, is a player they really appreciate. They are in negotiation for a loan with buy option. They also ask for information on, on Dan Juma, uh, who could be a big opportunity because the player is available on the market. He will leave Villarreal in the next weeks. And so Everton and many other clubs are following this situation with a Villarreal winger and also striker center striker is a priority for Everton they are in conversations with Atalanta for Colombian striker Duban Zapata uh, now Atalanta have this new gem it's called Rasmus Hoilund this striker uh, who is mm, jo who joined uh, from uh, Sturm Graz in the summer he's doing fantastic so Duban Zapata could be sold Everton are trying this negotiation but they offer the loan with buy option Atalanta only want a permanent move for Duban Zapata so conversation will continue let's see if Everton will have I think two three new players by the end of the window we have a few more questions left to get to Fabrizio before we let him go let's turn our attention to Juventus real quickly now Juve this was a funny story uh, Fab I mean uh, Kvaratschelia when he scored against Juventus there was this Ruben Kazan troll video I don't know if you saw that when Ruben Kazan posted this video making fun of no, the fact see. that did you see it did you never see this one yes. never I mean they were I'm making not a fun big TikTok fan big TikTok fan that's why <laughs> but they were making fun of the fact that they could have potentially bought him for about 20 yes. million and then he goes ahead and scores a goal like this I mean they were saying that 20 million was too much for him um, only a couple of years ago and then two years later this guy is tearing up I mean this is a bit of a slap in the face to Juventus are we starting to see some mistakes happening with the transfer window when it comes to UV behind the scenes? I think, first of all, this is not a true story because Juventus wanted Kvaraskelia, but the price was 35 million euros, not 20. And it's not easy to sign a guy from Georgia for 35 million euros. So I think Napoli have been fantastic because they decided to go for him, but at the right moment during the war. And that situation changed, of course, the scenario on the market. And that's why Kvaraskelia was available for a lower fee. But to spend 35 million is different. So I think we have also to understand Juventus' position on that one. Of course, Kvaraskelia is a fantastic player, but I think we can understand that 35 is different from, from 20. And also um, about, about mistakes, I think is, is not an easy moment for Juventus. Uh, we can see that. Uh, also what they, what they did on the market in the last few years, I think investing on too many old players was probably a mistake uh, also during the summer. To give you an example, uh, Juventus had in the list players like Mudrik and Berardi in June when the price was completely different, was close to 30, 35, 40 million euros. Berardi is doing great with Sassuolo. Mudrik, we know the world story. And they decided to go for Di Maria on a free. Fantastic player, but is about the present, not about the future. So this is what they wanted to do in the summer. I think this will completely change next summer. Juventus will go with young players, will go with a fresh project, new people into the board. Let's see what happens with Allegri, but for sure Juventus will, will focus on the future. That's why you're the best, Fabrizio. <clears throat> Fab, just a quick one. With, with Napoli doing so well and um, in the Serie A, obviously everyone's looking at the talent that they have there. What's the chances of Napoli really doing something silly and letting one of their top players leave in this January window? No way. Uh, I was answering some questions right after the Mudrik story because I saw many Arsenal fans saying, OK, let's try to sign Kvaraskelia. Yeah. I think today <laughs> it's, easier, it's easier to sign... Uh, London City than Kvaraskelia, really. Because we have to understand that, uh, trust me, for Napoli, it's not just a great season. We have to remember that Napoli are not winning any important title, a part of the Coppa Italia, the domestic cup, but they're not winning any important title. It's like 30, 32 years. It's unbelievable what's happening to Napoli this season. It's really special. So the feeling into the club, into the dressing room, into the city, is not just a normal season. It's something historical happening to Napoli. And so they will not sell any star in general. It's not about the price. It's not that you go there with 150 million euros and they sell Kvaraskeli and Oz Oziman. No way. Napoli are not selling their stars. They're not even negotiating. So 
impossible. I think in the summer it could be different, especially for Osimhen, I think, because many top clubs will arrive for this incredible striker who is doing very well in Serie A and in Champions League. But I think Varashkelia and Osimhen in January will absolutely not leave now. Just a quick one on that, Fab, quick follow-up. What top clubs would you say, just name top three for Osimhen in the summer, would you say? Many, I think, because there will be a domino of strikers. Uh, at the moment, it's, it's not possible to mention names, but I, I can mention clubs looking for strikers, and I'm sure they will be on it. For example, United will look for a striker. Uh, for example, Chelsea, I think, will look for important center striker. Uh, for example, Bayern Munich are looking for a striker to replace Lewandowski from last summer. So there will be many clubs on the market for a striker, and I'm sure they will try for Osimhen. But we have to see about the price, because Napoli spent 70 million to sign Osimhen. He's performing at an incredible level, so I'm not sure it's going to be an easy one at all. All right, last question here coming from the fans here. KSA man uh, saying, any Chelsea news uh, from you, Fabrizio? But we also have Fab Chelsea King asking, Louis Colwell signing a contract for Chelsea. Any latest on Chelsea? No, Louis Colwell is doing incredible on loan to Brighton. Uh, he's doing very well. So Chelsea are really happy with this development and they're sure he's going to be part of the project for the future. But from what I'm told, I was checking this news yesterday and I'm told that at the moment it's not something advanced yet. Uh, it will be discussed in the summer, I think, when he will be back from Brighton loan. They will discuss his new contract, but they're really, really happy with him. And um, on Chelsea, now, of course, they're discussing internally about the next step. It's also important to sell or offload some player after signing so many players. But I would keep an eye on, again, on Moises Caicedo. He's a player they really appreciate. He will have new agents in a few days, so that will change the situation around Caicedo. And let's see what Brighton will say. Always tough to negotiate with Brighton, but he's a really important player in the list at Chelsea, so I'm sure they will try. 20 minutes with Fabrizio Romano and look at all the topics that we managed to cover here. AB shouting out good evening to House of Champions, good evening to Fabrizio Romano, love to you as well. Aaron, big shout out to you, KSA man and Roger, shout out to everybody out there. Ranger, you're asking if this show happens every week, it happens pretty much every single day. We're on five days a week, but also Fabrizio is on two days a week right now, especially through the transfer window, so make sure you follow along. Final, 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 final question because we love you so much. Messi update before we get out of here. There will be a meeting in a few days or weeks. They are still deciding. It's still not scheduled. But there will be a meeting between Paris Saint-Germain and Leo Messi to decide the length of the new contract and then to get it signed. So from what I'm told, Leo Messi will stay at PSG. No bid from Alilal. No bid from any other club. Also Barcelona is romantic to mention Leo Messi and Barca, of course. But at the moment, there is absolutely nothing. Messi is focused on PSG. He wants to stay at PSG. PSG, of course, wants Messi to stay. So there will be this meeting very soon. And I think uh, soon we will have the announcement of Leo Messi staying at PSG. Milan against Inter, Super Cup final prediction? I see Milan winning. 1-0, Leao goal. Boom! And that's how he leaves with a <laughs> mic drop right there. Fabrizio, we absolutely love you. Thank you so much. Make sure everybody out there is following Fabrizio across all of his social media platforms and his YouTube page. Just an outstanding human being. Uh, great in the transfer market, but just a wonderful brain when it comes to the football world. Fab, we'll see you <laughs> again. You. Have a great weekend. To everybody out there, make sure you stay with us. More to come from the boys when we return. As we get stuck into Liverpool Football Club, you're watching House of Champions. Don't stop watching Leo Messi, the man, the myth, the legend, Messi! the GOAT. The UEFA Champions League stream PSG matches live February on Paramount+. Plus. Well, don't miss out on any of this area action. Follow some of the biggest stars in the sport like Olivier Giroud, Rafael Leao, Lautaro Martinez as they try to lead their teams to Scudetto. How will the table change going forward? That's the big question. Which club has the best chance of winning it all? Maybe a bigger question. Which clubs have the most to lose? Find out all the answers and stream every single match from Italy's top soccer league live only on Paramount+. Plus. Try one month free with the promo code Serie A. You are watching House of Champions. Welcome back, everybody. Let's welcome in with a bit of a golf club here. Luis Garcia. He drinks sangria. Lucho, you look relaxed. You look happy. Liverpool must have won. Yeah, yes. I was enjoying uh, hearing you guys talking about all the transfer market situation and all the clubs. And all the clubs that they are not so well like Liverpool at the moment. But yeah, as you well said, uh, we had a good, a good game last night. Ian, you're lying. He only looks relaxed because Barcelona look like they're on sensational form <laughs> right now. It's not Liverpool related, okay? Yeah. All right, let's get back into it. Lucho, it's great to have you back on House of Champions. There's been a lot of people out there requesting for you to return and be a permanent part of the House of Champions uh, family. So we're hoping to make that happen at some point. Let's talk about the investment. We talked about it with Fabrizio and the Qatari Sports Investment Group. They're not in talks, apparently, to buy a minority stake at a football club. I mean, what are your thoughts on all the rumor about ownership? How does it affect the players? And what are you hearing? Because you're involved a lot with Liverpool Football Club. 
Uh, yes, uh, pleasure first of all. Very pleasure to be back. It's been, I've been missing you guys, uh, and all the best for this 2023 to all of you, and to all the people who listen to us. And it's kind of normal on these days. Before you couldn't hear that you now the club is gonna uh, change uh, of ownership or uh, there, there's someone coming in. But uh, on these days, I think it's kind of normal to hear that the club is gonna be uh, on sale or someone is gonna come and buy it and it's gonna bring a lot of money. I was reading. Uh, some news, some stats about uh, how much uh, Chelsea has uh, spent on the last six months. That is it's almost the same amount like Liverpool in the last six years because they have a new owner. So suddenly everybody wants someone to come in and start spending money and trying to find uh, the best players and to, to link with the best coaches. But at the end, it's not only about the money you can spend on the players you can buy. It's about that connection that you have. Uh, right now with the, your coach, your players and your crowd. And that's something that Liverpool has been working on very well in the past few years. That's why the success arrived. And I don't think that it's going to change much in the coming year. It doesn't matter if he, someone comes and put a lot of money on the table. Lucha, I'm glad you said that because I have a question for you because obviously we know you're a Liverpool legend and all the other clubs. So I've seen a lot of chat. People going on about one of the hottest properties in world football now in Jude Bellingham. Please, can you give me your opinion on whether Jude Bellingham going to Liverpool will kind of solve or fix all the problems that people seem to think that Jude Bellingham mm -hmm. can do if he joins Liverpool. Yeah, if he joins Liverpool, if he joins Real Madrid, if he joins all the teams that he's been linked. And of course, he's a, he's a great player. Of, of course, I think he's got a lot of room to improve. Uh, he could be one of the best uh, players in Europe for the next coming 10 years. But it's, gonna, no, it's not going to solve any problems of any team. A player cannot change a team. Only Messi can do that. And um, yeah. there is no other player who can change that kind of situation. You need more things apart from that. Can change the dynamic of the team? Yeah, I, I think so. Because when, when something positive arrives and suddenly the, the mentality of the players think that it's going to help us. So you kind of uh, mentality change a little bit. You start to change. So you approach the game different way. So it could help that. Is going to improve or change the, the the momentum because that lasts maybe two, three weeks. That's it. If you cannot manage to work on the other aspects, it's not going to last for the rest of the season. It's not going to change the, the moment of the team or, or the, the way that they are playing. So I think that not only do Bellingham is needed, but Liverpool a few more things probably. James, I know you work obviously around the Premier League and even some of the lower leagues. You're following football intensely and you get to work around a lot of these big football clubs. Now, at Liverpool Football Club, I am noticing that there's a lot of people behind the scenes leaving the club, um, especially front office, sporting director. I think director of research just left and then a couple others were poached by Bournemouth, if I'm not mistaken. You know, when they see these types of changes taking place, you know, what are your thoughts? You're on the outside looking in at Liverpool Football Club. You know, we obviously see the product out on the pitch. We see the frustration from Jurgen Klopp. But surely off-the-field noise must at some point affect Jurgen Klopp. It must affect decision-making. And at the end of the day, affects the performance on the field. Are you, do you agree with that or do you disagree? Oh, yeah, I don't, I don't doubt it. And, um, I mean, I remember Klopp talking about this earlier in the season. And um, he was a little bit... I, I think the thing with Klopp is he can be quite spiky um, and kind of refuse to acknowledge the truth. Uh, and, and I think... You know there are two there are two sort of paths here. There's the big picture, you know, FSG looking to to cash out. Basically, they bought Liverpool um, at the perfect moment. You know, when, from their perspective, after the dreadful uh, predecessors, they were able to buy it on the cheap. It has now exploded in value, and it has done so because they have managed it really well. Mm -hmm. But it's also what's also true, and and this really struck me kind of at the Champions League final, um, and in the weeks after it. Was it just, it, it, it felt like, under, completely understandably, Liverpool as an entirety was just drained, like it had done so well. And remember, they played every single game they could play last season. And every single one of those games mattered, you know, down to the final kick of the Premier League season, down to those, you know, closing minutes of the Champions League final. And it was a really, I think, tough and, and grueling and disappointing, despite winning an FA Cup and a League Cup, it was a really tough way to end that season. And I think there is a hangover. Um, and you, you you kind of have to intermingle that with the, the fact that the refresh that should have happened didn't. It's happening in the back offices. And it's it's kind of hard to do that whilst also not refreshing yeah. stuff. It just felt like a club that had 
had used up its energy reserves and done so spectacularly. Um, and I think there's time for a re refresh. I think what's really interesting is, and I know I, I saw you talking about, about this player, by, by Cetic uh, Lucho the other, the other day. He's phenomenal. Harvey Elliott as well, the match winner against Wolves. There are, the, the long-term future looks really bright and they are a well-run club with a big stadium, with talented academy, all those things. But I think there's just going to be this little teething period in the middle when... Fabinho, Van Dijk, all those guys are a little too old and the new guys aren't ready to come in. And that's natural. You know, we've, we see this with, with every club. And um, I think this is a challenging moment for Liverpool, but it doesn't stop the fact that they are superbly placed to, to be perennial contenders in the Premier League. Lucho, how long do you think, like James has said there, this teething period is going to last? Because I, I do agree with James. I think they've got some great young talent. But again, it's just whether it's been too long to move on to the next generation or to blend them in quicker. How long do you think this teething period is going to last? And could no, it, it could be, be potentially listen, long like it was last time? Yeah, but listen, I mean, uh, I'm going to go to Barcelona last year. I mean, the process can go very fast, very quick. If you suddenly sign like, six players, good players, all of them, or it could be slower bringing the Pedris, the Gavis, the Balde, the, play, the young players who can... Uh, B to B coming in. I think that Barcelona last year, no one was expecting that at this point this year, they could be at the top of uh, La Liga, three points uh, ahead of uh, Real Madrid and playing the way that they are playing, be looking solid. And looking, if you have a look now, they have the whole squad fit. That's something that we forget. And I think that the Jurgen uh, talked, uh, Jurgen Claude talked the other day. I mean, yeah, you can go and, and sign two players up front and go and sign two players in the middle and go and sign two players. But at the end, they only play in even every single weekend or in midweek. And you need to manage those rotation. And yeah, it's true that you can uh, talk about what we talked before. Uh, when the, the, they arrived to Madrid and they and it was uh, Shakiri and it was uh, Wijnaldum, mm -hmm. the ones who were playing, or Igi, who were important. They, they were not playing during the, the season. Yeah, that's, imp that's okay. I understand that. But at the moment, the players who were important last year, like Luis Diaz when he arrived, Diogo Jota when he arrived, they, they made a, a, a straight impact into the team. They are not there. Van Dijk, that this season has been... Up, with ups and downs, it's understandable. J James just mentioned that last year it was draining. They they were they are exhausted. But most not only most minutes of any player in the world. Last yeah, year, yeah, played. exactly, exactly. And they, they are at the moment they are exhausted, but uh, physically and mentally, and it's very difficult when you have six of the players they are tired mentally and physically, and they are injured. So there are a lot of things that you have to manage. And yesterday was a good game. It's true that it, was, it wasn't the best game that we've seen Liverpool, but it was a good game because they were they looked solid. Konat, I think, was very impressive at the back. Uh, Stefan in the middle, it was okay. Um, uh, Harvey, it was okay as well. So at the end, yeah, but this is not the Liverpool that we all know. This is not the Liverpool that was overrun in every single team. And that's got not go we're not going to see it probably in the next year or so until all the players that they are... Uh, on the on, on the bench waiting for the moment are fit and when they are another two or three players with the same level of the ones that are right now uh unfit uh arriving to the to the club and this is a transition but i don't think it's gonna last it's gonna take maybe two or three years i don't think that i think it's gonna be shorter than that i think it could be next year if this team at the weekend they play against chelsea guys and if they win they are gonna be seven points uh from third position champs league that's the main target at the moment Having that, uh, getting into the Champions League, it can change all the, the way that we see Liverpool now yeah. from the first moment in two of July next year. Uh, one thing I'm really fascinated about, bigger picture with Liverpool, and you mentioned uh, Luis Diaz there as well, but uh, the, the three new forwards they've signed, one of the things that they did when they put, put Salah, Firmino uh, and, and uh, Mane was these were all the sort of stats nerds like myself, They're our darlings, because they got these huge expected goal numbers. No one was really paying attention, and they, but they were kind of underperforming these stats that you knew they'd start performing towards. Whereas now you have these three, Diaz, Gakpo, and uh, the one I want to ask you about, and our listeners want to ask about Darwin Nunez, who just had hot streaks um, before arriving at Liverpool. Gakpo in particular, there's so many questions. There's questions over Darwin Nunez. And I thought Rafa Cardenas was right to hit on this player as, as, a, as one to ask you about, Lucho. He's, he is the most unmissable player in the Premier League. And, you know, will he fit the system? He is so raw, so energetic, so mad. He's, I can't help but watch him, but do you think he's going to come good? 
I think it will it will take a little bit of time. I think that the the way that he plays is special. It's not it's not the number nine that we were all expecting. It's not the number eleven on the left side that we were all expecting. It's different. He needs freedom to move. He needs to sometimes go on the left side and start making diagonals. And that's something that for for Liverpool in the past few years where you could see that four three three formation at every single moment during the game. Everybody was in their position. There was no much freedom, only a little bit in the middle. So he needs that kind of freedom. And he beat a bit. I've seen some of the runs he made. They are fantastic. They are very, he's very clever. Now, when he doesn't feel the pressure that he needs to score, we could see him uh, assisting Mo Salah a couple of times. That he didn't score, but it was a very good assist. It was good movement. It was a good pass. And he, it was the finish that we've seen the other day it was fantastic. So I think he will, he will come when there is a lot of pressure now on the game and on the team. And I think he arrived to the team where the team he was going down. We are not seeing the Liverpool that he was going high, good results, everybody playing well, everybody. He arrived to, to the moment that the press, the press is not the best one at the moment. They are late. They, are not, they don't have the same legs that they, we've seen before. So he needs to do extra efforts all the single time. So I think they will arrive at the point because he's tall, he's very good in the air, he's very aggressive, he's good with his feet. And I think that he's got that finish that he was missing. It will take a little bit of time. Probably next season he's gonna be at his uh, best performances, but it will come. I I think that this is a, is a player for Liverpool definitely. Lucho, I love you to bits, mate, but I'm gonna disagree with you. Like, <laughs> I fine. just don't think he is gonna come good for Liverpool. I why, why, why not? Why doesn't he come good, Nigel? Because it's too system based. I think Jurgen Klopp has always had a style and a system, and. He does not really have players that can express themselves out of that system. And it never works. And if you want to make a little bit of comparison, completely different, we've seen now with Manchester City finally getting found out against better sides, even though Manchester United's performance wasn't that great, about Haaland. Haaland needs to be a bit more involved in the football aspect. He's not your typical striker. There was questions that came about it. And we can see now clearly how if it's not inside the penalty box, he can be completely missing. He doesn't affect the game. You know, you have to change the game a bit. Pep Guardiola wants to play total football. But if you've got someone like Erling Haaland, sometimes maybe you can go a bit direct. Get him up the pitch, let him hold up the play and make him making third man runs. Nunes, for me, I just feel like Lucho said it perfectly. He needs that bit of freedom. He needs to roam around. You can't do that in the Jurgen Klopp system. Jurgen Klopp is system-based. The start at Liverpool play is predominantly a system where everyone has to be in a in a certain position in relation so to would you say Mohamed Salah does that? Mohamed Salah does it, but there's a difference with Salah just drifting wide to coming inside the center and that's it interchanging those type of positions. But Darwin Nunes sometimes might want to drop a bit deeper and change completely, which affects players around you. And I think when I look at Nunes still, I just don't see a confident player. Lucho knows it. He's played with top class players. You know I some get of them. It. I get I it. Sorry, it. Sorry to interrupt you. I get it. Like, listen, the confidence factor is obviously a main, main point. I mean, Lucho touched upon the fact that he's just, he's entered the team when they've probably been playing at their worst football for, for years and, and they're at their lowest. They're exhausted. This team looks very tired and obviously the youngsters are trying to shine. They're trying to bring some energy into this team. Some of the experienced players look very exhausted and as we talked about, some of the big performers for them over the last years are not performing because they're probably too tired and with the system that Klopp does demand, Nigel, it's 110% heavy metal in practice. 110% heavy metal in games. One second. I want, to talk, I want to touch upon a little bit of comparison. I remember, obviously, watching some of the great players that Jurgen Klopp has obviously dealt with over the times. And, you know, I would compare him to a Lewandowski. I wouldn't say he's far away from a Lewandowski. Maybe he runs a little bit more than Lewandowski. He likes to drop a bit deeper than Lewandowski. Might go a bit wider than Lewandowski. But I don't think I agree with you as far as that he's not going to come good at Jurgen Klopp. I think he's a very quick learner. And what we've recognized with Darwin Nunes is that he's seeing that they need energy. They need hustle. The fans want fight. They want desire. They want passion. He's trying to give everything he possibly can to turn this around for Liverpool Football Club. And maybe he's over trying. Lucho, am I wrong there? Yeah, it could be. It could be. The thing is that he he does too much sometimes. If we think that this player could be at the front just waiting, like he does Haaland for, for Manchester City and wait for the cross and wait. But the team is not doing that at the moment. It's not creating chances. It's not... Um, helping him. He's not bringing the ball in good conditions for him. We've seen Firmino arriving and scoring. Last year, Firmino was on fire scoring goal when no one and, and no one was doing that. He was about uh, the, the flair to come down, link, lay down the ball. 
this kind of stuff. But suddenly it was scoring goals. Why? Because the team was providing these kind of chances. When you have a team that is uh, full full uh, in motion, everybody is in 100%, everybody's pressing, everybody's having the ball, everybody's enjoying it, full of confidence. Even, listen, even us, if we go and uh, play in, in that team, like, again, go and play for Barcelona at the front. Stay at the center forward. Are you going to score goals? Of course. You go behind Pedri, Busquets, uh, Gabi, Dembele, Rafinha, giving you balls. At the end, that kind of balls are going to arrive. But they are full of confidence. They are playing well. So that's easier. You arrive to Liverpool and then you realize that you have to run, you have to press, you have to score, you have to assist because everybody's expecting that from you. And there is no many around who are keeping you in the same direction. So it's not it's not easy to arrive to a club where the things are not going well. And I think that that's what happened with uh, uh, Darwin. So we need to give him the, the doubt and, and wait a little bit to, for the whole team to be fit, to be in the full, um, uh, uh, full strength to see if he can uh, deliver what he's expecting from him. Yeah. Let me just say this. I'm not saying that Nunes is a bad player or a poor player at all. I'm just saying he just will not work at Liverpool. I think yeah. he'll be successful at other clubs because of his style of play. My thing is this as well. And Lucho could probably add to this and you as well, Ian. We've played with many top strikers. We've played with great strikers. The one thing that worries me the most is when he does get those opportunities, those one-on-one -on -one moments and stuff like that, I don't see the arrogance and the self-belief in himself. Forget confidence because strikers go through different forms of confidence. I've played with a lot of pricks, but I'll tell you one thing that never leaves them. <laughs> Their arrogance. The arrogance and belief in themselves never leaves them. I've played with top guys where they've had great one-on-one -on -one situations and they're shooting. They're shooting because they want to score goals. Now, when you're seeing a top striker like Nunes, the money that they paid for gets in these positions and he's looking for the pass or slashing his shot, not getting it on target and he's missing the post, that is a bit worrying. He'll you call, do it he'll come, Nigel. He's 22, 23. Fernand, 22, Fernando 23, Torres. He's a, listen, Yuto, come on. You know if he's 17, 18, you can put your hand around. No, him but it's still, on, still, but 22 he's, still. He's still. In he's two years, listen, in, in two years, he's become one of the top uh, strikers who have, have paid a lot for him. In, in what, two, three? It was in Almeria no long ago. So, but, uh, listen, uh, it reminds me a little bit for the kind of uh, physical condition that he's got to Fernando uh, Fernando Torres, I was saying no. Fernando Torres. Oh, okay. When he was at Atletico de Madrid, he scored 13 goals. Full, period. That's it. For four or five years. And suddenly, no one was expecting arriving. We were we, we had a lot of thoughts of when he arrived to Liverpool. You know what? <laughs> he doesn't keep the ball much. He's not a good finisher. And that was that's the truth. I'm not I'm not lying. And he could, any player who has next to next to him, any teammate will tell you a lot of doubts when he arrived to Premier League. And suddenly he scored 35 goals. Why? Why is he's playing with you or Steven Gerrard? That's why. It's okay. <laughs> that's no, why. because so your goals. Yeah, but that's that, that's that's it. That, that that team was in full flow. What's one of the best uh, teams that the Fernando Torres could ask for? And he arrived there, and his full potential was about confidence. And now I'm here, and I scored the top 13 goals, and I'm the top scorer of the Premier League. Why is that? All the things were connected. Good players behind. They will give him the freedom to play. They will give him the uh, allow to to trust himself on the way. And suddenly you start finishing like Batistuta. So that's the thing. We'll give. We we'll need to give him the chance of being in a top uh, full flow uh, Liverpool. And then if he cannot finish uh, that kind of uh, options, we'll see what happens. Couple of nice comments coming in right here. Krishna saying uh, that Nigel should learn the story about Nunez, his personal story. The guy has gone through too much and done too much. He is not ready to fail. I think he does have that hunger, but not the team around him. But that's pretty much what Nigel is saying right there. Yes, uh, we also we also I'm have a few that. other comments coming in. Rafa saying I respect Nigel's insight about this. I mean, Nunez has shown potential, but made so many weird mistakes. It's fair to criticize him, and it's fair to doubt him. In my opinion, absolutely, Rafa. And then we've got Ali. A jumping in and saying Nigel is always negative come on <laughs> mate <laughs> Nigel you mentioned about playing with top strikers I'm not sure you could throw me into that category as uh, you and Lucho obviously playing at the highest level in the third tier of Scottish football at Montrose we had a striker yeah. who was a postman and let me tell you something <laughs> He was fucking deadly when he was delivering those letters. I'll tell you yeah. that much, man. Let me just. Did, did he always that. deliver? That was your chance to oh, say he was okay. delivered. So, James, let me say, like I said, I've played with some absolute assholes as human beings, as footballers as well. But I tell you what, the arrogance they have on the football pitch is a different level, and that's something I learned about what makes some of these top players top players when they get in those one-on-one -on -one situations. 
even if they can cut the back, cut the ball back to you, you know, you're in a better position. They're taking a shot because they want to score the goal. And even if they miss and you look at them and you say, why don't you pass me the ball? They'll look at you and just give you the, ah, oh, I didn't see you there. But really and truly in their mind, they're saying, no, nah, F you. That's what they're saying. And that's my point where I understand he's young, but the top strikers have that in them. But already. isn't that, but you get those, but, but, but that's a thing that happens. I mean, maybe you're, you know better than me, but kind of the way I sort of see it from afar is players have those moments. They have those runs of games, you know, Teddy sharing and might go 10 games without scoring. Um, and then, you know, the, there's a moment where the ball looks huge or the, you know, the goal looks gaping and that's when they take all those shots. And I wouldn't say, no, it's, it's not that for me, James. I'm saying, like I said, you go through periods where you're missing chances, you're in good positions and you should be scoring and you're missing. You, that's understandable. That happens. But when you get in those positions, you can still see and it's confidence and arrogance. And again, it's an individual thing, but these players do have it where they're still going to take that shot on and just get it on target in their mind. They're like, at least if I hit the target, I'm not going to get criticised. You don't have to Nigel, finish but it. But why did he do it last year with Benfica? Why? Different team. It's a different team with Benfica. I think probably it is a, a lot more energetic team, like you said. All Got right. some great quality in there. And I think he has a lot more freedom in Benfica. We saw some of the goals he was scoring and where he was being. And I don't think, for me, Liverpool are fully utilising him the way they should. I feel Liverpool now, as much as they want to play, as you call it, tiki-taki, you've got Darwin Nunes in the box. He's an aerial threat. Sometimes just get it out wide and get some crosses in. Maybe get Trent and Robertson getting more crosses into the box and utilise his aerial threat, which will open up the gap for midfield players to get more involved. So that's the thing. I think it's the system thing. We've said it before. I love players who come out of this system who change the games. There's a few players that we talk about. I think Ganacho at Manchester United is another player. You've seen the impact he can have when he comes on. He gets the ball. He looks at the defender, says, I'm going to beat you. They break this whole system style that we see that teams kind of nullify each other out now because they know how to be in these defensive areas and it gets a bit boring. Mm -hmm. uh, Lucho, Fantastic. just put, no. put a ball on it, finish it, and then let's get out of here. Don't yeah. finish me, Lucho. Don't say no, anything no, about no, not at all, not at all. I, no, I understand, I understand that you can see it this way. I understand that the uh, the system is something that is uh, we need to, to count on, but I think it's much more than that, than only the system. I think just the team is not in the, in the best shape at the moment. Yeah. And of course, we cannot see... I mean, when we are talking about uh, 18 years old, Stefan from Spain, that he was the best player yesterday. That and you got it on the team. Uh, Tiago Alcantara, you got Mozala, you got players who can be shining a lot more. Conateo yeah. is because this team is not in, in the in the in the best shape. So we need to wait and see when everybody's ready, when everybody's full feet, when everybody's looking the confidence like we've seen, and he's in both. And then we'll see when he doesn't have to have all that pressure on his back, all that. Uh, uh, load on his back and uh, share it with Salah and with uh, Diaz and with Firmino and with Jota, with all those players, then we'll see. Then we'll see, listen, okay, yeah, you can say maybe we can change, but at, at the moment, I think numbers are not bad, we have to say that. Numbers are yeah. not bad, and it should that he be missing. But if we think that he, if he score every single shot or every single chance, we will be talking about the best striker in the world, because or near Alan, um, we need to give him the chance of <laughs> let's see, because let's see what he can bring. I feel like Lucho should have the last word on Liverpool, but I'm going to dive in and steal go it ahead, anyway, just to prove Nigel wrong. Erling Haaland averages 4.1 shots per 90. Darwin Nunez averages 5.7. Like the guy takes shots. It's just some of them look horrible. But I, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm with Lucho. I, I love that. Statistics don't lie, Nigel. You can shake Fuck your head the as stats. much. <laughs> <laughs> you can be a person all you want, mate. I've been there. I've been there. Shall I tell you why I've been there? Let me tell you when I was younger and we played Chelsea and stats just came up into it. And then our manager thought, if you work harder, you run harder. Yeah, yeah. We looked at the day at the end of the game. We lost 2-0 to Chelsea. Chelsea ran half the distance that we ran. We ran double the distance as a team, as individuals, and we still lost the game. Stats only plays that much in the game, right? Because quality comes through in the end. So Not anymore. Not anymore. Statistics play more of a role. Uh, I mean, Liverpool have got a throwing coach. They've got a throwing coach, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's get out here, Lucho. Before we go, I hear you're playing a Legends game at Liverpool at Anfield in March. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and also where people can follow you because uh, we, we love you. The, the people love you. There's a lot of comments coming in. People are shouting for you. They want more of you here on the channel. 
Yeah, of course. Uh, well, you know that we are all uh, joining us uh, in Instagram, Twitter. We are all around. We talk a lot about football and you know that. We, we love that. And it's true. We are going to play another games, uh, another game uh, with the Foundation of Liverpool. It's going to be in March. And again, always for a great cause. We we use all that money to to help all the uh, the kids around the Mercy area. And there is a lot of good things that, that comes from that. We've been doing this for many years. All the people that comes, we've been having a full stadium every single time because there is a lot of good people around and they will enjoy. We cannot run as much as uh, at the, at the regular players at the moment, but uh, definitely you you will see some good plays and we always have a, a, a great time. I pulled a hammy just thinking about you running around for eight minutes. Uh, <laughs> we I need to get. Your... Hey, we need to look after ourselves before to go there because every single time there is more intensity, more intensity. We play against Real Madrid, Bayern Munich, uh, AC Milan. We play against United twice, and listen, every single time is harder and harder. It looks like everybody is on precision already. I love it. I love to hear it. Boys, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for joining us. Thank you to Fabrizio also for joining us. And to everybody out there, thank you to listening to House of Champions. Please take a minute to leave us a rating and a review on your favorite podcast platform. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere else you listen to your podcast. We're also available as video, so subscribe to us on YouTube. And apparently, stats don't mean shit. But guess what? We're back again tomorrow, so make sure you tune back into House of Champions. Nigel, final word before we get out of here. Can stats measure the content of a man's heart? No. Piss off of your stats. <laughs> Love everybody. Thanks for watching House of Champions. We'll see you tomorrow.